So I'm going to give you just a short introduction about myself. Um, I've had quite a journey in my life, but I'm not going to share it this evening because of the amount of time that I have available. But just to let you know a little bit of where I'm coming from and why the subject that I'm speaking to this evening is so important to me and why it's something that I've come to answer. So I was born into a secular Jewish home. Uh, I was raised without Judaism. I like to share that what my Judaism meant to me was it explained why I had a big nose, why I talked with my hands, and why I liked Chinese food. But other than that, it had no meaning to me. And anyway, I had a bit of a traumatic childhood, and I grew up in this condition, so to speak. And when I got to high school, I started to ask a lot of questions. And long story short, I ended up becoming a born-again Christian. I ended up marrying a pastor. We had our own congregation for many years. And then, as, as Providence would have it, we ended up moving into an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood with the intention of converting the Jewish people in the neighborhood to Christianity. Well, God had the last word. I came back to Judaism, so did our four children, and my husband, the pastor, ended up converting to Judaism. That's the nutshell story. Uh, there are a lot of amazing, crazy things that happened along the way. But that tells you a little bit about where I've come from and why I started to ask the question that I'm going to answer today. And that is, how can we know that God loves us? Now, the question of whether or not there is a God can sometimes be a difficult question to answer. It's very hard for some of us, although depending on your definition of God, it's actually not that hard to believe there's a God. It's much harder to believe that God is active in our lives, that he's interactive with us, that he cares about us, right? It's not so hard to believe that an intelligent being created this world, but it is hard to believe sometimes that he cares about us and that he's involved in our daily lives. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you can wrap your brain around the idea that there is a God, then I guarantee that there must be, that God must love you. And I'm going to answer the question first with one word. There's a one word answer to how we know for sure that God loves us, if there is a God at all. How is it that we can know for sure that God loves us? You ready? Chocolate. The reason I say that is this. Well, let me tell you a story. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was invited to speak in South Africa. I was on a speaking tour, and they said they wanted to send me to Cape Town. Most of my, most of my talks were being given in Johannesburg, but they wanted to send me to Cape Town, and I said, sure, you can send me to Cape Town under one condition. I have to be allowed to go on a trip up Table Mountain. Now, for those of you who don't know South Africa, on the edge, on the coast of South Africa, along the southern coast, you have Cape Town. And in Cape Town, there's this huge mountain that runs around the coast. It's called Table Mountain because it's got a flat top. And it's very, very high. And when you go up to the top of Table Mountain, the views are exquisite. In fact, on one side of Table Mountain, as far as you can see, you can see the plains of Africa. And on the other side, you can see so far out the Atlantic Ocean that you can actually see the curvature of the edge of the world. It's an incredibly breathtaking view. Well, I was up on top of Table Mountain, enjoying the view, having what we call a mountaintop experience. And I was, you know, wow, God, you're so amazing, and you're so huge, and you're so creative, and you're so powerful. And all of a sudden, it hit me. More incredible than the fact that this is so beautiful, and this is so big, and it's so incredible, is the fact that God created us with the ability to receive pleasure from it. Think about it for a moment. Who do you give pleasure to? Who do you want to give pleasure to? You only give pleasure to people who you love, you care about, right? So if God created us with the ability to receive pleasure from our senses, he must love us. Think about it. We don't have to be able to taste. Well, really, we didn't have to be able to taste anything. You could argue that we needed the sense of taste so that we would be able to tell what's poisonous or bad for us and what's not when food has gone off, although I'll tell you there are some people in my family who I think have no taste buds because they can't seem to tell when food's gone off. But just because we need the ability to have taste, the ability to taste food, for example, and 
to be able to taste all of things. You know, it's interesting, not all animals in the world can taste everything. Did you know that cats can't taste sweetness? And birds cannot taste the heat of a hot pepper. So God didn't have to create us with the wide variety of tastes that he did, but on top of that, he certainly didn't have to create us with the ability to receive pleasure from the things that we taste. Same thing with the sights that we see. Yes, we may have needed the ability to see, although we certainly didn't need the ability to see in color. Not all animals can see in color. And even if we did need the ability to see in color, we did not need the ability to receive pleasure from it. So the fact that God created us with the ability to receive pleasure tells us 100% for sure, if there is a God who created us, that he must love us. Now, okay, Panina, you say, it's fine and dandy. God loves us. Okay, I get that. But if God loves me, then why does it seem like sometimes he's out to get me? It wouldn't be fair for me to answer the first question without answering the second question. So I'm going to share with you three reasons, and there are many more reasons, but three reasons why bad things happen to good people, or why a God who loves us would allow certain things to happen to us. So the, the three reasons, I'm going to first tell you what they are, and then I'll explain them to you. So hang on and don't hang me with them. <laughs> the first reason that I believe that God, the bad things happen to good people is simply that we create it. Like I said, just wait and listen because, you know, I'm not blaming the victim and I'll explain what I mean in a minute. The second one is that sometimes we're in training for something much greater than what we understand or what we see, what we understand that we're experiencing. And the third reason is that sometimes something that may seem bad it's not really bad at all. It's just simply how we perceive it. Now, on the first question, it's interesting because there's a lot of people who are not at all interested in religion. In fact, to them, religion is something that disempowers people. They feel like if they admit that there's a God who has a standard, then certainly that must mean that I'm less powerful because I'm not the be all and end all of what's right and what I'm supposed to do, right? But the truth is, is that Judaism anyway, and the Torah is actually extremely empowering. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says, the Jewish Bible, the Torah, says that we're created in the image of God. And what that means is that we have the power through our thoughts and through our speech to create reality in our lives. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't know how to use that power, and it means that we create negative things that happen in our lives. The second thing, the second reason that bad things sometimes happen to good people is that we're in training. Now, we're here speaking to you from Israel, and in Israel, the soldiers who are serving in the army, which is pretty much everybody who, become, who comes of age, right, in the country, soldiers in the Israeli army are regarded as national heroes in Israel. Why is it that they're regarded as national heroes in Israel? Because they're the reason that we are safe in this country. They're the reason that we can live here. They are the reason that we are able to enjoy all of the freedoms and the different things that we enjoy in Israel. And so they're treated with a tremendous amount of respect. When they get out of the army, uh, while they're in the army, they uh, get pushed to the front of the line at a restaurant, they get free transportation on the buses, they get all sorts of things, all sorts of benefits because they're serving the country. And just a little reminder, they don't really have much of a choice, but they do it anyway. Well, when they get out of the army, there are other benefits that they receive, right? But there are some soldiers that go beyond. They go into what we call an elite unit. And when somebody serves in an elite unit, in the army, they, have, they are literally Israeli heroes, right? Those who have served in the Israeli army get a tremendous amount of respect, who serve in the elite units of the army, not only get a tremendous amount of respect, but even more so, and the benefits are even higher. Why is that? Well, those are the guys who are at the front lines. Those are the guys who are infiltrating the, infiltrating the terror cells. They're the ones who find the tunnels that get dug up. They're the ones 
who make sure that we can get on the buses without having to worry most of the time. But they don't go through just regular training, right? They first go through the regular uh, boot camp, we could say in English, right, the regular basic training. And then they go on to combat training, which is another set of training. And then those who are in the elite unit go on to elite unit training, right? And not anybody can just volunteer for this elite unit. You have to make the cut, you have to try out, you have to go through psychological exams. It's not easy. Once you get into your elite unit, the training is like what I can only call torture, right? It's very, very difficult because in order to do the job that they have to do, in order to protect the people, they have to go through this incredibly difficult training. In fact, if we were to sit, if we were a fly on the wall to watch this training that was going on, we would be absolutely positive that the people who designed it are absolute sadists, that all they care is about torturing people. Now, when the boys go into the elite unit, they know that their training is going to be torture. It doesn't make the training any easier, right? But it allows them the psychological edge to know that what they're going through is serving a greater purpose. What they're doing is greater than the pain that they're going through during their training. And so, when we go through difficult times, it's hard for us to see it. And it's knowing it doesn't even make the going through it easier. But it's quite possible that the reason we're going through a difficult time is that we are in training for something greater. Now, what really confirmed this to me was one time when I was speaking at a, a girls' high school, a religious girls' high school, and I shared in my story just one line about having been abused as a child. Now, when I was going through that, it was not easy. And certainly there were times when I was wondering if God could possibly love me, if he was allowing me to go through these things. And yet, this one line, I just mentioned it, and I moved on. At the end of the talk, I had three girls come up to me, and they said to me, we have something in common, can we talk more? I can't believe there's somebody in the religious Jewish world who actually can identify with what I've been going through because I can't talk to anybody here. And I realized that the reason that I had gone through those difficult times was so that I could be there for those girls who were going to need someone. And so I was in training for an elite unit. And I am just very grateful that I've been able to be there for them. The, so, just to let you know, any of you out there going through a difficult time, it may not make it any easier to know it, but maybe it will help you get through it, that you're in training for something incredibly important. Keep that in mind. The third reason that I believe that bad things happen to good people is they're not bad things at all. Now, what do I mean by that? Imagine you have a baby, and the baby has a bad diaper rash, right? So the baby makes in the diaper, and what does the mother do? The mother immediately goes and gets the baby and changes the diaper because you can't let it sit because it will cause more of a, a rash and could even eventually turn into an infection and threaten the child's life. So the mother knows this. The mother cares about the child, right? So the mother takes the child and immediately starts to clean the child and put them in a clean diaper. Now, the child doesn't understand what's going on. The child doesn't understand that the, he has a diaper rash. All the child knows is that my mother the one person in the world who's supposed to care most about me, who's supposed to protect me from being injured and from pain, has now just picked me up, put me on a table, restricted me, right? I can't go and play like everybody else. Why are you doing this to me? Why have you made my life so difficult? They open the diaper. You've exposed me to the world. Now I'm vulnerable and open to the world. And on top of that, the one person who's supposed to care most about me, who's supposed to keep me from pain, is like rubbing salt in the wounds and is making the pain even worse. The child does not understand that this is what the mother has to do in order to bring healing to the child. And there are times in our life when we're going through a difficulty, we're going through pain, but we see the world from the perspective of a child. 
We don't know what else is going on out there. We don't understand why this has to happen. All we know is, God, why are you making my life so difficult? Why are you restricting me? Why are you exposing me and making me vulnerable to the world? And on top of that, if you really cared about me, you wouldn't be causing me pain. Why are you causing me so much pain? And like the child, we have no clue. In fact, my grandson one time had a diaper rash and he's a little bit older and he went to his father and he indicated that he needed to be cleaned. And then all of a sudden you could see as he asked his father to change his diaper, you could see him realize what was about to happen. And he all of a sudden goes, Abba, no diaper, no diaper, Abba, Abba, no diaper, no diaper. And so many of us are just like that. We're in so much pain. We don't want to be exposed anymore. We just want to live our life like everybody else. And we're shouting, Abba, no more diaper. But like the child, we don't understand that this is what's necessary for our healing. And so it doesn't make it any easier when we're going through it. But hopefully, it can give us the perspective of understanding that there are certain things out there that are greater and, and deeper, and we just are seeing the world from the perspective of a child, and we don't understand why they happen. So I want to thank you. I'm going to actually open up to questions in the audience at this point. Does anybody have a question? If not, then I'm just going to answer one other question, because inevitably, when I talk on this topic of God loving us, the question of the Holocaust comes up, right? If God really loves us, and I'm not even getting into the issue of being the chosen people and what that means and anything else, but if God really loves us, all of us, all the people he created, because he gave all of us the ability to taste, right? He gave all of us the ability to receive pleasure. He created us all that way, so he loves each and every one of us. Then how is it that he could allow so many people to have been murdered so brutally, and of course we see it continuing to this day in different people groups all over the world. But as Jewish people, we specifically ask, what about the Holocaust? And I will tell you that it would be criminal of me, criminal, to try to give an answer. There is no answer. We don't know. Because this is one of those times when we are a baby on the changing table. And we have no idea what is needed, why it was done. We cannot begin to assume to answer that question. It would be wrong. Thank you so much for being an amazing audience and for listening to me.